Hello, everybody. It's Raina from Garden District Bookshop. And I want to thank you for tuning in again to our last virtual happy hour of 2020. We're taking next week off because it's Christmas Day. Tonight, I am joined by Nick Johnson, who is the co-founder of Libro FM. And Libro FM is an amazing little company that I have been a huge fan of ever since they started. They are the only digital audiobook company that partners with independent bookstores like us at Garden District. And I'm really excited to talk to him tonight. So I'm going to push the button. And hi, Nick. Hi, how's it going? Very good. How are you this evening? I'm just doing fantastic. Thanks for having me. Sweet. Well, thank you for joining me. Mm -hmm. This is going to be fun because, let's see, I met you, I don't know if you remember this, but I met you at Children's Institute in Portland, two and a half, believe. yes, like yes, two I and a half -ish years ago. Um, and I was like, I've got an email from this guy. <laughs> and yes. then I saw your table. I saw Libre FM's table. I was like, okay, one of these two guys is Nick. I'm just going to wing this. And yeah, it was like a five minute conversation, but <laughs> I remembered it. You stuck yeah. with me. And now you're the, you're my go-to at Libro. I mm -hmm. just always type Nick and that's, that's the only Nick in my contact. Nick <laughs> well, that makes it easy. <laughs> exactly. And you pop up there. So yeah, I think a lot of uh, booksellers find it interesting where when they send a question or something to Libro, quite often it's uh, me or one of the other co-founders who answers it. You know, sometimes it's a you know one of our support you know team members, but quite often it's me or Mark or whatnot who's like, hey, yeah, here you go, and you're like, oh wow, I didn't expect to hear from the CEO, but here we go. Yeah. Well, that's one of the beautiful things about working with a small business, which you guys are still that. You said you added to a lot of people though this year. Yeah, uh, 2020 has been a really weird year. Um, you don't say. Uh, as I think everyone knows, that's probably an understatement. But it's actually been a really, really good year for Libro uh, because basically every horrible thing that has happened this year has been beneficial for our business, which is yeah. puts us in a really weird spot. Like we're obviously we're excited that business is going well, but at the same time, we you know we understand it's not going well for so many other people, and um, so we've been trying to leverage that success to to you know prop up the industry as best as we can. But yeah, we started out 2020 with seven people, and we are at about 20 now. Um, we hired on, uh, temporarily hired on about a dozen booksellers back in, I think that was June-ish um, to, uh, you know, we, a lot of booksellers have been let go for a period of time and we needed some help. And then we actually kept a couple of those booksellers on permanently because they were just rock stars. And we brought on a lot of um, developers and other things. So it's, uh, we're still very much a small business and a small business mentality, but we are growing. That's... Um... That's really great. Yeah. <laughs> the short and sweet version is that is that's really great. Um, when you said you hired on a bunch of booksellers, what in what capacity? Just yeah. So you know, it was kind of right when COVID hit, and a lot of bookstores were forced to shut their doors. And you know, at that point, a lot of bookstores didn't really have you know pickup delivery or or a good online sales platform at that point. You know, it was just kind of everyone shut down immediately. Where for us, uh, that led to a lot more business for us because people are, you know, want they had more free time on their hands to listen to audiobooks and they wanted to still support their local bookstores, um, but they couldn't go in. So we saw an influx of business and we needed help with that. So what we decided to do is to hire on um, booksellers for just a four week stint to help us in all aspects of the business, be it helping write social media content, helping with graphics, helping curate playlists or make quizzes or whatnot. Um, and I think we had a couple hundred uh, applications from booksellers, which was very, very difficult to whittle down to a dozen because they were such, such great people. But we did. We narrowed it down to a dozen. They came on for, I think, a little over four weeks to help us out with some things. And then a couple of them we offered uh, positions afterwards because, like I said, they were just such great rock stars. Yeah. Well, it's... Um a lot of fun. So on Libro FM, you guys, all the the recommendations are not generated by some magical algorithm. They're they're generated by booksellers 
Um, and I'm, I'm assuming by you guys there. Yep. And so when you go on there, you get to see what booksellers actually said about the book, uh, blurbs, recommendations about these books. And then your also likes are coming from what actual booksellers and users and the creators have put together, um, which is a lot of fun for me um, because you love getting your blurb out there. So <laughs> as a bookseller, it's fun to get your blurb out there. And um, I really appreciate that piece of your business, mm -hmm. especially from a consumer, but like from a bookseller as well. One of the things I'm really excited about is um, soon, this is one of the features we're working on, is that when you're actually in the app listening to audiobooks, uh, soon you'll be able to actually browse books in the app too, which is great. You won't have to go back to the website. But beyond that, if, if you're associated with a store, for instance, uh, Garden District, you will see recommendations from Garden District employees in the app. So, you know, someone Ooh. might be in the app and they'll see a, a recommendation from a person they actually know down the street. And that's the sort of, you know, that's what we're really excited about is having recommendations that are, are real recommendations coming from real people and not just, hey, this is the best seller in the genre that our algorithm says you like. That's that. That's smart. Yeah, and that, um, that's cool. We're we're, you know, it's something that we can do that no one else does, and we're proud of that. That's going to put the pressure on the individual bookstores in a way. Like I, I don't know so. how many how many um, recommendations we've put out there ourselves. Like I don't know that. Mm -hmm. And then like if ours are the top ones to come up in the app, then of course like I'm going to want to put more out there so that totally. you're like, seeing ours top front and center on the app. And we have ways that we're working on also to make it easier for booksellers to make recommendations too. And again, soon you'll be able to actually make recommendations in the app. So you'll finish a book and it'll say, hey, you're a bookseller. Do you want to make a recommendation on behalf of your book? And you can write about it. And so we'll make that easier too. Yeah. Well, I'm listening, you know, to audiobooks all the time. So <laughs> Same. I, I listen to audiobooks not just in the car, but like when I'm doing chores in the shower, like taking a walk. Uh, anytime I can work in even like five minutes of an audiobook, totally. a lot of times I'll be doing that. Um, which I just learned that I, I have a few friends that I didn't know that they did this, but they read the audiobook and listen to it at the uh -huh. same, like they have the book and they're yeah. reading it. Like, and it reminds me of those like magical like Disney books you had as a kid, and then the, you know, the sparkle you know, noise and yes, turn the page exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's like that never, it never occurred to me to even try that. Well, until. it's interesting because uh, a lot of uh, younger children and middle readers will do that. They'll read the book and listen to the audiobook at the same time, which is great. It helps with vocabulary and comprehension and there's a ton of benefits. But a lot of adults do that too because it just, it it's, makes it almost a little bit more enjoyable of an experience for, for some people. Um, and I think it's great. I, I love it when people do that. And you know, they're buying a print book and an audio book. And so that's two ways of supporting their store, which I'm a fan of that. Exactly, exactly. So, all right, so my big question to you is why, why did you pick audiobooks? Like, why did you do this? Yeah. <laughs> that, that's a big question in a lot of ways. Uh, and obviously it, it's a business, but what drew you to this? It's actually not too terribly complicated. Um, so I went to the University of Washington and two of my friends, now co-founders of Libro, also went to the university with me. We became friends in college. And we all wanted to start a business together. We had very different skill sets. I actually studied fine arts. Uh, my other colleague, Mark, studied business. And my other colleague studied um, computer science. He used to work for Google. And we thought, hey, this is a really good trifecta of skills to start a business. So we kept you know, throwing out ideas for, for different businesses and we'd always tear them apart because nothing was quite, you know, nothing held up. But then Mark who um, studied business and has his own kind of boutique publishing company saw that he had these books that he was publishing and he wanted audiobooks to be a part of his offering because they were growing so dramatically, but he had no way to promote them in bookstores. Like his authors would go around to bookstores and he would want to say, hey, go get the audiobook." But if you said that, it basically meant go to Amazon's Audible. Right. And, you know, he obviously didn't feel right about that. And so it was kind of an aha moment for him where he's like, hey, there's a niche here of a growing market, audiobooks, and an underserved market, bookstores, who aren't participating in that growth. 
and have no way to participate in that growth uh, without a company like us stepping in and doing that. Right. So that was kind of the genesis for the idea. He brought the idea to us. We loved it. Um, I personally wasn't that familiar with audiobooks at the time. I like podcasts, but audiobooks are kind of new to me. But I loved bookstores, and I've always loved bookstores and reading. I'm I'm a I've always been a voracious reader, mainly in print. Now, kind of combination of print and audiobook. Um, but so it was kind of a no brainer to at least try it out and see what happened. Yeah. And um, that was a little over seven years ago now. I think November thirteenth was our seven year anniversary. Wow. And um, yeah, it just kind of started out with an idea and then it just grew, 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 grew. And now it's, now it's something. Yeah. And, and like you said, in 2020, kind of, you were poised for this moment that kind of handed you all these opportunities to grow. Yeah. Over, um, in a way, I mean, we, we have been growing pretty significantly since we started this, which, you know, sl slow and steady growth, which is what we've always wanted. 2020 was weird though, just because like I said, there's these terrible things happening, but they're benefiting us. You know, people, stores are closing, so people are turning to online to be able to support them, which is great. Um, people are, are losing their jobs, so they have more free time, so people are, uh, you know, listening to more books. Racial unrest is happening, and people are looking to educate themselves, and the book, physical books are sold out, so they're turning to audiobooks. I mean, these are all great things from a business perspective, but the root cause of them all is, like, right. terrible. So it's this weird, almost survivor's guilt where we're very, you know, happy that we're doing well, but at the same time, at what cost? Um, but it's been good because it's really forced us to kind of look at our business and make sure that, you know, we're doing good in the world. We're leveraging that success to help out bookstores and authors. And we actually just this year in September became a social purpose corporation, which is kind of like a first step to becoming a B Corp where you're a for-profit company, but you have um, a, uh, a social uh, improvement bent to your company. You have to put out a report about the social impact that you're making, which will be released in a couple of weeks. And that's been cool because it's been a way to really put our, our money where our mouth is. You know, we talked about wanting to do good things, but now we are legally required to do socially good with our business, which is great right. and, and to be accountable for that. Right. Yeah. It, it, it keeps you, it keeps you accountable. It keeps you mm -hmm. with that same, with that focus. You can. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, it don't have survivor's guilds because <laughs> like, yeah. cause yeah, you're going to in that. And that's, that's true. And as a company, but you, you guys are doing what you can, you know, mm -hmm. and that idea you, you give back as, as you move forward mm -hmm. is important and you're definitely doing that. And that's Thanks. one of the reasons why Libra FM is the best. I, I would have much more survivor's guilt if we were just pocketing the profits we were making this year. But, you know, yeah. we've done some really cool things <laughs> uh, with, with, you know, the success we've had. So it, it definitely helps with that, uh, that survivor's guilt feeling. Yeah. And I, there's a thing um, when I'm talking about Libra FM to customers that is is something to kind of, I have to get over with them because they don't you, when you think of an independent store or a mom and pop store of any kind you think of a little shop mm -hmm. um, that you go in and and it's there and it's physical and that's it uh, even even smaller stores that get a big location big physical location as soon as they become a certain size people start to go oh they must be this huge corporation yep. and a lot of times that's true but it doesn't have to be yeah. And then especially online only situations like Libro FM, it's they're like, what, really? You know, and I'm like, yeah, really. I was just talking to the guy. There's like 20 people <laughs> in a room. Yeah. Like, that's it. Um, <laughs> but you do have to kind of explain. There's like this extra level of ex explanation just because you're only online. And that's weird too because you wouldn't say that of an etsy shop for example yeah, they're only yeah, online exactly. uh, this is just a lady making you know bookmarks with crocheting bookmarks that's totally fine but like once you go into these certain markets that's a difficult sell uh not not sell that's not the right word it's not difficult it's um you do have to have that further explanation yeah. with people well, and, it's a, yeah it's <laughs> an interesting balance because we are a small business. Like I said, we're seven people at the beginning of the year, bigger now, but we're a small business. But we also, we don't really take a personal, like most people who come to the Libra website 
don't really know about me and Mark and my colleagues and whatnot. We're very much behind the scenes. And that's purposeful because we really want the personality to be the bookshop. We want, when someone comes to Libro supporting Garden District Books, we want them to know that they're supporting Garden District Books. We want them to see Garden District Books logo. We want, when they get their thank you, you know, for signing up or their thank you for your purchase, we want it to come from Garden District Books. We want them to know that even though, yeah, we are this tech company that is building this, this tool for, you know, Garden District to sell this product, the relationship they have is really with Garden District Books. And you, we want to make sure that they remember that. And then on the flip side, we want to make sure we uphold that relationship and that we, as a, you know, adjunct representation of Garden District Books, we want to make sure we're not doing anything to jeopardize that trust and that relationship that you have with your customers who, you know, come into the store or whatnot. Well, we definitely see that, and that's um, a, I think that helps with people, that helps them, you guys are helping us build a relationship with our customers. Yeah. And we appreciate that, and I know other indie bookstores appreciate that as well. Well, I think one of the things that we, we I think we've done successfully is that um, we, before we built the company or built the technology behind the company, really got to know booksellers and got to know them and know what they really wanted and knew, you know, what sort of tool would be best for them. And, and they got to know us because the book selling industry is pretty small and close knit. And if you, you know, if you do a good job, booksellers will talk to other booksellers and say, Hey, these guys are legit. They really care for your best interest. And I think we've done a, a good job of doing that, a good job of getting to know the industry, getting to know the people, being responsive, uh, you know, admitting when we make mistakes, you know, making adjustments and changes and recommendations based off what we hear from bookstores. Um, you know, and I think, I think bookstores have been burned by some other big companies in the past, try, you know, promising something similar to what we do, but then not really fulfilling on that promise. And so we've been, in a way that's helped us because it gives us something to be compared to. And right. uh, we, for the most you're part, shining. You're shining well, so. now, so it's working out. Yeah. yeah. I think that's just the sun right now coming oh, in. Well, you know. <laughs> um, okay, so we have a question. And how do you choose who reads the book? So I'm gonna interpret this as mm -hmm. the narrator. Mm -hmm. Do you guys have anything to do with that? No control whatsoever. Yes. <laughs> we, so we don't uh, we don't do any audiobook production um, at all. So all the books that are available through Libro. Um, come straight from the publishers. So the publishers have chosen the narrator, usually working closely with the author and whatnot. So um, yeah, so that's something that we're not involved in. So can't really give an answer to it. Now, sorry, Linda. This is probably far in the future, but is that something on your five-year plan? You know, or something? Uh, no, not really. At least I wouldn't say on the five-year plan um, for sure, because. You know, we have other other things we're working on that we think are a better fit for our company. And there's some really good resources out there for people who want to um, produce their own audiobooks or, you know, um, have them produced for them. And I'm talking about really good solutions other than Audible and, and yeah. their things. There's some really good people out there that we already partner with. And, um, you know, we, we push people, you know, when, when an author comes to us asking about how to produce their audiobook, we reference these other companies and say, hey, talk, talk to them. They're going to do you right. And um, I don't see that as being our spot in the market, at least not anytime in the near future. Right. Well, that was actually a good follow up question because we do have quite a few local authors. And I know one that wants to definitely get her books on audio. And mm -hmm. then, you know, other people have asked different things. And so you do have a reference. If I sent them, if I said, oh, you know what, I'm not sure, but like, ask yeah. Oh, whoever. yeah. They would the, be. the best place to send people is uh, LibraFM slash authors. And we have a really great resource page that talks about how to partner with us and how to get your audiobook produced so it'll be available on Libro and through your bookstore. And then also ways that we can partner to promote audiobooks and, and whatnot. So um, that's a really great resource. And it's an easy URL to remember. All right. See, I've already got it right there in the comments. Perfect. <laughs> All right. So Linda is listening to Patricia Cornwall and Randy Wayne White right now. Um, do you do you read any mysteries? Uh, do I? Yes. Well, I um, 
A few. I like the Agatha Christie. Agatha Christie, I've always liked her. Um, I always mix some of those in. I recently read Ruth Ware's new book, which is like a modern Agatha Christ Christie. Mm -hmm. um, I think my favorite mystery series is the uh, Flavia de Luz series oh, by I love those. Alan Bradley. That series, yeah. I forget how many are in it now, seven or eight or so. Yeah. But having a, a precocious 11-year-old with a British accent, um, my daughter's 11, so it, it's right in that great time um, or age range for me. I love those books so much so that my uh, pet cat is named Flavia. So yes. <laughs> All right. I am going to put in the comments to the Flavia DeLuke series. So, oh, they're so good. This comment is going to Garden District Bookshop. So that's the um, that's the print book. But when you click on it, you'll see right underneath the picture of the cover, it says get the digital audiobook, and that goes straight to Libro Fib so you can get them and from I would our page. I would suggest both. I have some of the novels <clears throat> in print and I have some of them that I've listened to audiobook. And they're they're great in both formats, but I do absolutely love the narrator of the audiobooks. I think they're mm -hmm. just fantastic. Sometimes that narrator can make or break an audiobook sometimes. Yes, it can. <laughs> All right, Marissa asks, what else are you working on that you think will be a good fit for the company? I'm just adjusting this. The sun this, is this, getting too much. The sun is getting a little bright here. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> You're gonna get a little, a nice tan on this, that one side. Exactly, right. so I'm just gonna, I think, relocate to a less sunny room. Um, <laughs> What do I think would be a good fit for the company? We, uh, geez, what's the best way to answer that? We are doing a lot of, like our goal, I should say, just our overarching goal is to not just do audiobooks. Audiobooks are certainly kind of what we're doing now, but we really want to be the technolo technology provider for independent bookstores because I think we're really, really good at doing technology. And if there's things that we can do to help independent bookstores focus more on what they like doing, um, you know, that's that's kind of what what we want to do. So what do I mean that by that? You know, we kind of view, um, we view the book industry as having like, we call it the three C's. And this is based off of some study done by um, Ryan Raffaelli of Harvard. And that's community, curation, and convenience. Community is all the bookstores. The bookstores, you know, they know their customers and they, they build that community. Same thing with curation. The bookstores curate fantastic titles, but the convenience I think is sometimes difficult for bookstores, especially in the online environment, how to make it really, really easy and convenient for customers to make a purchase and to enjoy audiobooks, eBooks and whatnot. And that's where I really see us fitting in is helping build the technology to make it so bookstores and booksellers can focus more on the community and the curation aspects. So it's kind of a vague answer, I, I know, but that's uh, that's kind of the direction we're heading. No, that makes sense. And so many indie bookstores need that. Mm -hmm. Like our bookstore has, this is our 40th anniversary this year. Um, Congrats. And our, we've had the same owner from the beginning. And so in 40 years, it is hard to keep up with where technology especially is mm -hmm. going. Um, and I've been working there a little over five. And so one of the first things when I showed up, I was like, there's these little things and a lot of them were tech related. And I was yep. like, why do we do this? Like, how does that, like, why don't we do it this way? Yep. You know? And a lot of times it was just like, I've never, that's never crossed my mind, yeah. you know, like, and, and I think a lot of bookstores are like that where they, they've it had a model that was working and it's, still functioning, okay, yeah. and so why change it? But as things move, and, and this year, again, especially, ha took, it, it forced a lot of yeah. us to, into the 21st century in a way that we had been like dragging our feet on, uh, you know, a lot before. And so having someone or a company that's there and we know and we trust that is partnering mm -hmm. with us, to say, hey, look, look at this new, look at this new thing. We got it all working for you. Exactly. We got it working. Just this is how just, you put it use in. It. It. This is implemented over there for you. You know, is so amazing. Well, the you know, I am I have a tech background, a tech and art background, and quite often I'll log into bookstores websites for them to help them out with something because they're just not techie. 
Yeah. And I'll, you know, I'll find out that it takes an hour to do something that in reality should take five minutes, if that. And that, you know, process of taking an hour is like, there's like 20 steps and you have to remember those steps. And if you haven't done it in three months, you have to re-remember it. Wherein it should be something that's very, very easy, very repeatable and something that's a simple task that even if you haven't done it in three months, it's very easy to do. Um, you know, that's the sort of stuff that I think we can help with. I mean, it's not groundbreaking. It's not like, oh my gosh, you're used to a horse and we're introducing an automobile. It's just, you know, we're just introducing ways to do things more efficiently that then you could take that 55 minutes of time that you saved and use it to talk to people on the floor, use it to make more shelf talkers, use it to host a book event. I mean, that's, that's what we're trying to do. It's like I said, nothing crazy. It's just coming from the outside in, we see a lot of inconsistencies and a lot of areas that could use improvement and we're uniquely positioned to do that. Absolutely. And you know, so many times it just takes the person or the company to, to do it. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, somebody yeah. has to come in and say, why do we do this this way? Yeah. And make everybody think just for a minute. And then a lot of the times we've made a lot of changes, you know, just over the last few years based on new blood kind of coming in and going, why did we do that? Mm -hmm. And then everybody going, I don't really know. Yeah, exactly. Let's figure out a better way. You know, if there's a better way, let's work well, on it. And I think, you know, books bookstores aren't tech companies, so they, you know, they right. shouldn't be tech yeah. companies. And I think there's very few bookstores that are big enough to be able to really build like a an audiobook app or something like that. Yeah, but as a whole, you know, there's plenty of bookstores as a whole that you know, that can do that. And so that's kind of where we fit in is partnering with everyone to build one tool that everyone can use and and structuring it in a way that it doesn't cost booksellers anything. You know, it's not like you have to, as a bookstore, pay to use Libro. It's it's free. And then we just take a small percentage of the sales. And that's our revenue model, which is great because it's, you know, your budgets are tight anyway. So we don't want to, you know, have you guys cutting us checks when you, you know, might be worrying about letting go a bookseller or something of that nature. Marissa has another question. Do you see yourself collaborating with bookshop.org on that in any way? I'm not sure that specifically that she's talking <laughs> about, but. Uh, well, the, the, hi Marissa. Uh, yes, we do. And actually we currently do collaborate with bookshop.org. So if you go to bookshop.org right now and click their uh, audiobook option, it actually takes you to Libro to get the audiobook. So yeah, we currently partner with bookshop.org um, in that way. And uh, we're big fans of what they're trying to do there too, because they're they're trying to, you know, anyone who's trying to help out the the bookstore community, we're, we're a fan of. And so, yeah, we have a good relationship with them. Something about indie booksellers and bookstores that people don't know, I think a lot of times, is that we, we don't really combine Pete, mm -hmm. like other stores do. Um, we're very collaborative. I will gladly tell you which bookstore to go to in some other town. I will gladly tell you if I know that Square Books in Oxford has signed copies of something, I will gladly tell you, go there, get it. You know, they'll oh. mail it to you. And they do the same for us. And that I think catches people off guard a <laughs> lot of times. And I see that with, with you guys at Libro too. Like the point isn't to get in and get as many as you can and, and like, you know, kind of create this competition. It's mm -hmm. like, we can all get in and you guys can be a tie that connects us all together. Exactly. And I remember, you know, a few years ago when, when we were all just starting to sign on to Libro and hear about you and, you know, figure that out it would be a thing we would talk about. Like I'd run into another bookseller, I'd go into another bookstore, I was like, oh, are you guys are doing Libro too? Oh, that's so cool. Like, uh, or have you heard of Libro? Like we just started signing up for them and like, you know, have you heard of that? And talking about this, this new thing that again, ties us all together, makes us all like part mm -hmm. of the same community. Well, um, it, it, one of the things I really like about that, what way we've taken that same concept and put it into the online world is like the playlists. Like Garden District has a number of playlists that you've created. And playlists are basically just curated lists of audiobooks. Um, you know, you have a really great, I think, summer road trip playlist I just yeah. saw recently. And what's great about that is that other stores can share that playlist, even though the customer is still a customer of their store. You know, they may be a... Uh, let's say a uh, women's fiction bookstore 
and the customer comes in asking about uh, a children's title. Well, they could be like, oh, well, so-and-so is a children's focused store and they have these really great playlists, check it out. And the person looks at that playlist and you know finds their book, but at the same time, they're still supporting your store. So it's a really kind of cool way to do it. And I think that's an online example of just the, the community and the industry as a whole. Exactly, yeah, absolutely. Um, and Marissa says, yes, that seems like a similar goal, the streamlining and supporting indies. Yeah, yeah, that's very much, uh, you know, similar to what books, Bookshop is doing. And, you know, that's what we're trying to do is we're trying to prop up indies, give them another market that they can participate in, streamline the purchasing process. Because, you know, right now, customers, even though I don't like it, they go to Amazon to buy a book and it's, you know, one click. And you go to most independent bookstores, websites, and it's, you know, eight clicks. And uh, that's just, that's, that's not good. We need, to, we need to make it as convenient as we can. I don't think we'll ever get to the point of Amazon, but if we can get within, a, you know, pretty close to that, then that convenience factor isn't going to be a deterrent like it is right now for people. Exactly. Another thing that amazes me when I, I start talking to customers about Audible and Libra FM and, you know, similarities and differences and all these things, the number of people who do not know that Amazon owns Audible yeah. blows my mind. Yeah. It, you may have noticed during this conversation today that I've said Amazon's Audible. It, yeah. Every, every yeah. time I reference it, I always say Amazon's Audible because, yes, we found that same thing is a lot of people say, oh, yeah, I love audiobooks. I listen through um, Audible. And we're like, oh, well, that's that's great. I love that you love audiobooks. But have you ever thought of not supporting Amazon and instead supporting, you know, your favorite local bookstore? And they're like, what do you mean I'm supporting Amazon? We're like, well, it's in their logo, Amazon <laughs> company. And they're like, Whoop. yeah, it blows our mind, too. So yeah. Educate as much as we can. And also with authors. A lot of authors don't realize that, too. I, I, I that's absolutely. I try to approach every. Uh oh, Raina, I, I don't know if I froze or you froze. Oh, I can still see you just fine. I don't know if you can hear me, but I can hear. Oh, okay, there, there you are. You're back. Okay. okay cool. Okay. Okay, good. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's um, they don't. They just don't uh, pay attention. I guess don't pay attention. But customers and and authors, it's not. Um, you just think, where am I going to get a book? And then you go. Huh. It just it's right there. It's convenient. And it's convenient and it's right there. And it's a lot of times all you have to do is say, hey, did you know? Yeah. You know, and they didn't. Yep. And it's not going to convert every single person immediately. But what you put that thought in their head that they're, you know, aware that that's what's happening and that change, you know, might happen today. It might happen in a year, really, you know, but it's it's there and yeah. they'll work toward it. And um that's fun. <laughs> it's fun to hand them one of your bookmarks and yes. you're like, hey, by the way, did all you know? those things. Yes. And well, pay my paycheck. Here. It's it's a pretty easy sell, we've noticed. You know, most people when we tell them about what we're doing, most, very few people are like, oh, I don't like that. Most people are like, oh, that's fantastic. And most people are really on board with it. The harder part is getting people to actually do it. Uh, just because people are busy, they have other priorities in, in their life and things like that. So getting them to actually, you know, cancel their Audible account and start up a new Libro account, even though it's only a couple minutes, if that, yeah. again, people are busy. And so, you know, most people love the idea, then getting them to follow through and do it, you know, that that's the next step. When that's, yeah, and that's the same with everything. Like it's, the idea yeah. of supporting an indie bookstore sounds great, getting them in the door the first time. Yes. You know, it's the hard one. Once you get them in there, yeah. Then you're like, oh, look, they exist. Oh, it wasn't that hard. Oh, I got a book, you know, yeah. and that's, that's. E that's eating great. healthy and working out every day seems like a pretty simple concept, but I'm not as good with it as I should be. <laughs> right. It sounds yeah. great. Yeah. Um, all right. So Marissa has another question. So who, who is this Mar Marissa? She's asking know. some pretty good industry. Like, right? she, she knows. knows. The industry. All right, Marissa, you got to tell us who you are. How are you connected to the industry? Are you a bookseller? Do you want to be a bookseller? <laughs> yeah, she, she's asking some great questions. Yeah. So what is your relationship with the ABA around mm -hmm. your future plans of streamlined tech for indie booksellers? Sure, <laughs> sure, sure. So first of all, uh, we, we've we had a great relationship uh, with the ABA since the onset of Libro. They were some of the first meetings we ever had were with the ABA saying, hey, this is what we're thinking of doing. And even though I wouldn't say the ABA was super 
confident that we would achieve what we've achieved, they were very helpful. They were like, well, hey, good for you. Try it out. We'll try to help you out as much as we can. But I think they were always kind of like, oh, we'll see what happens. But um, obviously, we've, we've done uh, very well. And a big part of that success has been with the ABA supporting us. So we're big fans of the ABA. I personally, you know, I don't want to put let the cat out of the bag, but I personally would love to basically take over what the ABA is doing with indie commerce. Um, I think we can do a really, really good job of it. But also, I think the ABA, again, kind of, as I said, I think to you earlier, bookshops, bookstores shouldn't be tech companies. I think the ABA doesn't necessarily need to be a tech company. There's so many other great things that they do that they could focus on. And um, we might be a really, really good partner for them. So I know we've had some initial discussions with them. I believe we're going to have a discussion in um, the early, early next year um, about this very concept. Um, but I personally have a lot of ideas of how uh, we can uh, improve the online experience for independent bookshop customers and really would like to partner with the ABA to do that. Marissa works at an indie publisher. There we go. Okay. Books. See, you had to be in the industry somewhere. Yeah, there was a couple, you know, a few of those questions were like, eh, someone know, knows a little something here. Well, thank you, Marissa, and thank you for your, your kind words. Uh, that's awesome. Absolutely. So there's something I definitely want to get to before we get done, which we've got, mm -hmm. we've got some time, but it is too late to ship books. Everyone, it's too late yes. to ship books. Um, what we have on the shelf, we have tons of things on the shelf. Please come buy them. We will wrap them up for you. We will hand them to you. Curbside pickup, local delivery within five miles. But if we ship out, it is not going to arrive in time for Christmas. Yep. But we do have a solution to that. We do. So yes, Libra FM has gift memberships. Totally. Tell us about that. Tell us about exactly. That. So I, I, first of all, I'm gonna. Second, what you say there is there is still time to order locally and swing by and pick it up curbside or get it locally delivered. So I want to first and foremost advocate that everyone does that, because if you're really looking for a way to support um, independent bookstores right now, that is the best way to do it. A uh, bookstore makes more money off that than from us than from bookshop than from anything else. So uh, first and foremost, go do that. If you don't want to, though, yes, we do have uh, gift memberships, which is a uh, the URL is libro.fm slash gift. It's really straightforward. And we basically have um, four different options, a one month membership, a three month, a six month, and a year long um, membership. And basically what that equates to is just a credit. So either one credit, three credits, six credits, or 12 credits that you can gift to someone and you can do it instantly. So even if it's Christmas Eve at 11.59 p.m., <laughs> you can do that. It only takes uh, less than a minute and then it will arrive in their inbox um, prior to Christmas Day. So, yeah, it's it's instant. It's quick. It's convenient. And one of the things that I'm really excited about that we've done this year that we've never done before is that annual membership that the big gift, as we call it, it's expensive. It's one hundred and eighty dollars. But what we're doing for this holiday season is that half of that one hundred eighty dollars goes directly to the bookstore. So that's $90 of profit for the bookstore um, from that one gift right there, which normally it's it's obviously a much lower percentage than that. But, you know, we, we see the value in helping out stores right now. That's another one of those kind of instances of being able to, able to leverage our success and do some good right now. So, um, yeah, so the gift, gift memberships are a great idea. Even if you don't go for that big gift, it's still supporting the store and it's instantaneous delivery. Yeah, I end up, um, I've given credits away the last two Christmases. I mm -hmm. fully intend, um, there's a birthday that I have failed to, <laughs> to send anything in the mail for. So that is happening. Uh, they are getting Libro Film credits for sure. Mm -hmm. And um, I also like that I can send specific audiobooks. You can, yeah, you can. Uh, you know, if there's a specific book that you want to send, for instance, Flavia de Luce. Uh, Sweetness at the Bottom of the Pie, I think, is the first in the mm -hmm. series. If you wanted to send that to somebody, um, you could do that on the website. Just give it as a gift, and there's very simple steps for that. Um, and you can either give that just you know, paying with a credit card, but you can also give that using your membership credits. So if you are a member or someone gifts you a member and you have credits in your account that you haven't used for anything, you can gift books to other people with your credits. So we have some 
customers who kind of accumulate more credits than they can listen to. And then being able to allow them to gift those credits to people for you know birthdays and other things like that is uh, really convenient. That that is where where these gifts are coming from. Yeah, it's and that was my uh, my CTO who just walked by. Ah. He's one of the guys quarantining with me right now. <laughs> See, he's it's it's a family affair. You it's have a, like I said, we're all friends in college. We started a company together and are still friends. Yeah, that's awesome. That is awesome. Um, uh, yeah, so I love I love being able to give specific books because there's there's two different there's two different types of people people you know well enough to pick a very specific book for yes. and the people you're like okay I know you listen to audio but I don't know what you'd want and I love that you can do both of I think those when when in doubt I tend to give a gentleman in Moscow that's kind of my go to gift because I haven't met a single person who didn't love that audio book I mean, it's a great book in general but the narrator is just amazing. All right. See, I haven't listened to a gentleman in Moscow. I listened to his uh, earlier book. Yes. Uh, what's it called? Uh, um, Rules of Civility. Yes. Yes. Our um, book club chose it to read, and I end up listening to most of my book club picks. Yeah. Uh, I run the book club at the bookstore, and I love that it gives me this opportunity to listen or read to book read books that I don't normally mm -hmm. would normally pick for myself. But a lot of times for me, that is not, I, if I start piecing through a book, I don't already like really want to read. I'm like, yeah. oh God, it's, oh, it's, Well, I, like you said, you can, uh, you can listen while you do other things, while you're doing chores or gardening, or I, I have an old car, so I'll listen to audiobooks while I'm working on my car. I mean, it's things that you wouldn't normally be able to enjoy a book doing. Yes, yes. The gentleman uh, in Moscow is funny because I was talking to, um, I, I actually a little plug. I am a, a Rotarian. I'm the president of the Rotary Club in my community, and we had our meeting this morning. One of our Rotarians is uh, from Paris, and he was saying how, like two nights ago, it was near bedtime, and he needed a new book to read. And I had recommended a gentleman in Moscow because I do a, a book recommendation every week. And he was like, "Oh, okay. I'll just I'll read a few pages of this before I fall asleep." And he said he was up to like four in the morning reading it. And then the, again, the next night he had to finish it. So I think that's such a, a great one. Yeah. So a gentleman in Moscow, I was going to ask you like what one of your favorite audiobook recommendations is. Yeah, I have, uh, gosh, a gentleman in Moscow is always up there. I love, I, I tend to like books with cantankerous old men, like uh, mm -hmm. a man called Ove. I love also, you know, that kind of cantankerous old man sort of vibe. Mm -hmm. I really enjoyed, actually, one of the first audiobooks I ever listened to was Ready Player One. which That was good. I love that, and it was narrated by Will Wheaton. Uh, Ready Player Two just came out. I listened to that, too, and it was also fantastic. Um, so those are some highlights for me. But I listen to all sorts of things, sci-fi, mystery, you know. I guess I don't really listen to romance, but I, I'm, I'm pretty across the board with what I enjoy. Does Will Wheaton... Uh, read Ready Player Two. He does. Yeah, because I again, actually just listened to Ready Player One, like a month ago. Okay, I re I re-listened to it before Ready Player Two, and I always think that's funny because both books actually reference Will Wheaton, and he is reading yes. the reference to himself, which I just think is fun. <laughs> yeah, that's one of those total dork nerd things to care oh, yeah. about, but a little it in, gets in, me every it's time. It's just a little. Everyone needs a little bit of joy in their life, even those little tiny moments. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite audiobook productions that I've heard, like, I don't know, in the last few years, is See You in the Cosmos um, by, it was a Jack Chen? I know, the, yes. I know the title. I haven't read that one. Yes. So it's, it's technically a middle grade novel, I think. Uh -huh. Could be YA middle grade. That line is kind of blurred. Uh, yeah, that's right. I love YA books. Yeah. Um, and I, there's a dog. There's a dog in the book. And in the audiobook, when the dog gets closer and farther away from the little boy, oh, his yeah, tags yeah, yeah. like tinkle further and closer. So you'll hear the dog coming and then he'll go, oh, Carl Sagan, Carl Sagan's the name of the dog. You know, oh, Carl Sagan, and he'll talk to the dog. And I was like, the first time that happened, I'm like, oh my God, that's amazing. And, then, and it goes all through the whole book. There's these little things. There's, there's a scene where some people are talking on the other side of a sliding glass door and you hear the sliding glass door close and then you can hear muffled speech 
And then you are in the little boy's head, he's thinking about what are they saying, oh my gosh. So that's the narration, but you can hear them, it gets louder and, and softer when the door opens and I was like, I'm sold. I mean, the book, I love the story of the book, but that audio uh -huh. production was just top notch. I would recommend that to anybody, even if they weren't like middle grade readers necessarily because of the stories so and the production together. You're, you're getting into a really interesting, uh, segment here and i just sent you a link in the private chat that you could potentially share if you want yeah. um you're getting into kind of the the concept of the future of audiobooks and one of the things that i think is really really exciting is called 3d audio or immersive audio and it's um it's basically what you're talking about and the example i sent you is actually a youtube video so uh you know watch the youtube video gotcha. you don't need to look at it but here's the key you have to put on headphones okay Okay. It, it won't work with just regular speakers, but if you put on headphones, it sounds like the person, it's a, a barber shop and they're cutting your hair. It sounds like the person is walking around you and you can hear the scissors and it feels like it's behind your ear or in front of your ear or whatnot. And what's so neat about it is there's no new technology needed to create these 3D audios. It's just how they record it and you don't need special headphones. You don't like, it's not like a VR set or anything like that. It's just regular headphones, but the way they record it with these specific mics and then the way they process that audio um, is, is very easy to do, but it creates it a very immersive experience. And for some books, it probably wouldn't add, in fact, it might detract from it. But for other books, especially like you said, middle grade books, mm -hmm. books where you're really trying to catch a kid's attention, with different characters like dogs and, and spooky ghosts or whatever. It's absolutely fantastic. So that's one example. There's another example about um, walking down the street in New York and you can hear like ambulances driving by and people selling hot dogs and dogs barking. It's just absolutely amazing. Yeah, and that would be amazing as an audio book where you're getting the, you know, the narration and everything, but then you hear the ambulance go by. Yeah. It's, right. oh my gosh. I think there's a lot of really cool things that are coming with audiobooks. 3D audio being one. I think um, some of the biographies from musicians. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I am yet to see, I really wanted this to happen with a Bruce Springsteen book, but uh, I'm yet to see a audiobook where they talk about a song or a period of someone's life and then they actually play that song in between the chapters and then they do the next one. Um, I think that could be a really, really neat experience. You get into all sorts of weird licensing issues right. at that point, but if someone could crack that nut and make it happen, I think it would be amazing. Have you listened to As You Like It? I think is the Carrie Elwes, is that? As You Wish, no. As You Wish, yes. As You Wish. Yes, I so, did. I'm a big Princess Bride fan and that one was fantastic. And they did, they had some similar aspects to mm -hmm. what you're talking about because it's it's Carrie Elwes's book and it's mostly him but mm -hmm. he, there's these snippets from interviews with the rest of the cast and then there were there are a few snippets like from the movie they're real mm -hmm. short so i wonder if it has to do with with you know the the rights and everything like you of can you got 10 seconds or something like you have a very short amount that you can share but that was that reminded me what you're talking about uh, i think that. uh one of the best ones I've read, uh, that was a fantastic one. And then uh, the Beastie Boys book that came out about a year ago. Uh -huh. that I haven't read a, that. It was but... an amazing audio book specifically because they had the surviving members of the Beastie Boys talking, but then they had other artists and, um, talking. They had other celebrities, you know, doing parts of it. I mean, it was just fantastically produced. Um, it just made it it was a great book in and of itself, but it just made it that, that level of more interesting. And um, I think Lincoln and the Bardo by George Saunders, that had like 140 yes. plus narrators, yes. uh, some of which only had like one line, but it's still, it was a very interesting experience. And it won, like, I mean, it was like the most narrators. I don't know whether it got a Guinness world record or some, some. something like that. With It was an interesting one because it's a very, non-traditional format for a book or an audio book. So I actually had to go into my local bookshop just to look at the book and see how it's presented on the page to make sense of the audio book. Mm -hmm. I did the same thing. I did yeah. the same thing. I started listening to it and then I went in, you know, the last day that I worked, I was like, I've got to flip through this because I need to see how it is actually pieced together. Um, there's, 
so that lends itself to some of these books that are better as an audio. Mm -hmm. You know, I think also a lot of people think that audio is just an, you know, an alternative to reading yep. or, or a different way to read, which is true. But in certain situations, it's a better experience or 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 a definitely a very different because if you can add in the other voices and you can add in snippets of the song you actually get to hear that's yeah well i mean better. uh i haven't read it yet but a promised land i've heard is a fantastic book but imagine having barack obama read you a promised land or like for instance my wife when she listened to becoming she's like oh michelle's like my best friend now because she yeah. listened to michelle read to her for 20 hours. Uh, I, there's certain books that I think, especially um, memoirs and biographies and whatnot, where I think it really can elevate it. Now, flip side is there are some fantastic books where for one reason or another, the audio book just destroys it or the narrator destroys it. So it, you know, it's not always an improvement, but there are definitely books that I think lend themselves well to audio. And for me, there's certain books that if I've read them in print, I will lots of times go and listen to them just to see how it compares or vice versa. Mm -hmm. I've listened to some as, as audiobooks and said, oh, I need to have this on my shelf and then gone and bought the print book. I do that a lot. I have yeah. a separate tag in my in my app for books that I've listened to that I want to buy. Wanna buy. When, I, yeah. Yeah, when I get around to Gotta it. Add to the permanent it. collection. Exactly. exactly. Yeah, exactly. I do that. Uh, on a book that I thought was going to be really great read by the author and turned out to be not at all. Uh, Charles Bukowski's The Naked Lunch. Okay. I thought, hey, he's reading it. He's the author. He's a wild and crazy guy. Oh my gosh. It's like <laughs> the, worst. the book. I ended up eventually like actually reading the book and, and I was like, okay, I get where he's going. Yeah. But it was just, it's like, it's a live recording. So it's like uh, him yeah. sort of like doing this like mumbly thing of the naked lunch, which is already kind of just out there and hard to yeah. follow with. And I was like, I don't know what is going on. This guy is not all here. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, you know, I don't want to knock on anybody, but there are definitely some books that I've listened to where like instantly I was like, nope, I can't, I can't do this for whatever reason. And I think, you know, I think a lot of authors, they're writers for a reason. They're not voice actors. Mm -hmm. And um, it's hard to, you know, I think narrators are very, very skilled at what they do. And so, you know, having a professional do that, you know, sometimes you can get away with it if it's a business book, but if it's anything other than that, I think it's difficult. Um, that said, there are a couple fantastic authors like uh, Neil Gaiman when he reads his own books or um, H is for Hawk is read by the author and I think Vesper Feist is too. And, mm -hmm. you know, they're just absolutely amazing. David Sedaris, I'm listening to um, The Best of Me right now. And he's obviously got such a, a unique voice um, so sometimes it's amazing, but yeah, it, authors reading their own works can often fall flat. Um, yeah, it does. It, it it's a uh, it's a hit and miss. But yeah. when they get it right, I I I like the authors reading their own works better. Oh yeah, because they know where the pause is supposed to be. Yeah, you know. Um, Though I've also so heard interviews with authors who find it really interesting listening to the narration of their book because the narrator chooses to do things differently than they expected. And I'm sure there's some authors who hate that, but I've heard authors who are like, oh, that's a different take on how I meant that passage to read, but I mm -hmm. like it, you know? And so I think it just depends on your, how open-minded you are, but you know, when they do it right, it could be really, really powerful. And that must be the same if they turn your book into a TV show or a movie or something like that. You're like, you have to, you you have to decide how you're going to handle it. Are you just going to step back and enjoy the, this new interpretation, or are you going to be like, oh, they ruined it? Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, exactly. Kind of it's probably how you're feeling that day. <laughs> exactly. Um, so Hope recommended Pat Conrad's mm -hmm. My Reading Life, which mm -hmm. I have not listened to. That I read it, but I haven't listened to it, and I did greatly enjoy it. Yeah, I'm not familiar with, I mean, I, I, I've seen it, but I haven't listened to it. Um, and then the same with uh, the Robin Wall Kimmer, uh, Braiding Sweetgrass is a book that we've been promoting a lot recently. I haven't read it yet myself, but heard fantastic things about it. And Pat Conroy, he's reading his own. I just looked it up there and provide, you know, put the link in the comments. So he did read that himself. Um, That's cool. 
You know, one of the things I just I just thought of this right now with braiding sweet grass, and I hadn't mentioned it before, but this is another thing that I think I've been very kind of going back to what we we're talking about before, very proud of our company about is that we've really stepped up promoting um, BIPOC, uh, indigenous, uh, Latinx authors. Um, you know, we kind of went with the kind of racial awakening that I think a lot of the country went through earlier in the year. We certainly had that happen within our own company. Uh, we were, you know, we had a pretty good mix of men and women, but we were very heavily white and, and you know, had a very much a kind of a, I'm not going to say a closed mindset, but we certainly could use some more perspective and some more diversity in our team. And we set some really specific goals and, and made those public, again, for that whole accountability aspect. And we've done a lot to promote BIPOC, Indigenous, Latinx authors and have percentages of, you know, where we're, when we're promoting books, let's make sure at least 50% of it is BIPOC related. Um, because we, th we think it's really important to get those voices out there. And kind of to your point, it's not just an algorithm that's shooting out, hey, these are the best sellers right now in the country. It's like, hey, these are books that we think are worth people listening to and are important voices that need to be heard right now. And Braiding Sweetgrass, it just jumped out at me because that's one of those titles. It's uh, <clears throat> another difference is if you are only buying books for from audiobooks or or print books from a certain large, yep. Uh, online entity, you only will get recommended books that are like the books you've already read. Yep. Um, because that algorithm is doing that. When you read this you know, mystery, then you must like this other mystery. There's no other crossover, mm -hmm. there's no other anything. And um, with Libro and with other indie bookstores, you, that's not what you get. I'm not, yep. I, I've read things across the gambit. So you tell me you like mystery and I'm like, okay, but I know this other book that yep. has some mystery elements in it. Yep. Technically not a mystery, but I bet you'd like it. Give exactly. it a shot. Exactly. It's that, bet, that human element where as you get to know your customers, you, you see the nuance of their personality and what they might like. And you know, I think one of the issues with Amazon and whatnot is they are spitting out bestsellers and, and they're only bestsellers. And there's there's a place for those for sure. Yeah. But independent bookstores are where upcoming authors, unknown authors, that's that's where they get their start. That's where they you know can potentially make a living. And you know, seeing value in that and seeing value in getting other voices heard, I think is really really important. Hi Rebecca. Rebecca's my friend. Hi Rebecca. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So, yeah. so anyways, that was a little aside, but I well, just, no, it's not I think because it's it does, it pulls into what you were saying too, because um, you have to work to read outside your comfort zone, whatever that comfort zone is. Yeah. Um, just like anything else in life. Mm -hmm. And with the recommendations and things, you get to say, okay, I see that you've read these like five white males yep. and that's cool. Those are good. What if you read, you know, this African American? Male. Let's yeah. just switch it. Let's just go just one step, just yeah. one step over. Still, still a dude, but yeah. Right. And with authors too, a lot of the times it's hard to tell. It's not like a TV show or a movie or even music where you, you know, you're seeing a music video or something. A lot of the times you're looking at 10 book covers. Yep. They've all just got, you know, a garden scene and some gold scrolls on it. Who knows what it is? Like who knows? Unless you really open it up and you care to really, really look at that. But us, we do, right? That's yeah. part of our job is to see who the authors actually are. So when we get the opportunity to recommend things like that, whether it's, you know, on Libro where you're, that's just popping up for you or personally hand selling it, I can see the, where you, you know, I can, I yeah. can give you this little bit of a. Well, when you, you know, when you go onto Amazon's website, their book website, you know, the 20 titles you're going to be presented with, you can pretty much guess. And same thing if you go in one of their bookstores. We have one of their bookstores in Seattle, and I went into it a year ago, and it was exactly what you'd expect to be on that kind of front table or that front wall. But when you go into an independent bookstore or Libra FM's homepage, you know, you'll, you'll see some of those titles for sure, but you're going to see a lot of other titles that you wouldn't see on that you know, that very, very important wall space or, or table space uh, right at the big, right when you walk in the store. And that's, that's good. That's important because someone might not know that that book was written by a, a woman or a BIPOC author or a trans author and whatnot. They might just pick it up because it's a good cover. And then they'll discover that later. And it's like, oh, cool. Great. Oh, right. Yeah. 
Didn't yeah. matter at all. Did oh, it, yeah. it's still a great story. Still exactly. a great story. Yeah. Still a great story. Exactly. So. Well, Nick, we've made it to 6 p.m. How? Well, I didn't even look at my me, clock. I didn't so even look at my clock. Yeah, wow. <laughs> it's so early for you still. Yeah. And, Four and o'clock that, on a Friday. I'd usually check out by now. Uh, what? <laughs> You're not still nose to the grindstone. It's not even. No, I I got little girls at home. I got to get home too, you know. So uh, that we 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 work hard at Libro, but at the same time, we we like to keep the family balance in there. Oh, uh, that's important. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, everybody, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you, Nick, for joining me this way. This yeah, way. it's my pleasure. Yeah, you're over. No, over there. Yeah, yeah there it's we weird. Yeah. <laughs> you think I'd have it by now, but I, I do not. Um, and everyone, you can get your gift cards, you can get your gift memberships, you can gift Libro FM, and you can do it today and it will arrive, or you can do it on the 24th and it will arrive. You can do it the 25th morning, they'll never know. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it will go through and it'll be great and it will get there in time. And if we can, um, if you have any other questions about Libro, uh, you know where I am at Garden District. We will we will get you set up with a, with a membership. And if I have any questions, I can email Nick and be like, oh yeah, I got you. And I, you know, honestly, email me to Nick at Libro FM. It's pretty easy. I'm always up for answering questions and talking with people. And that's what's great about Libro. You can just email them and they'll just answer your questions. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. so. Thank you very much, Nick. You have a good night. Thank you. You too. And fun. happy holidays. Thank you. Likewise. Yes. Bye-bye.